Anyone who dreams of going to the Olympics, it's gold or nothing. You know, that's what the media is talking about. That's what you dream of. I had family members of people that would be over to our apartment. Oh my God, are they here? Are the medals here? And I was like, you know, like I would just kind of throw them at him. I'm like, I don't, <laughs> like, I don't even want to look at them. As an Olympian, as a professional athlete, as someone who it seems like you've dedicated your entire childhood and your entire teen years and your entire 20s to a single sport, a single thing of getting a gold medal and then not to achieve it. Oh my goodness. Is that not the most painful thing in the world or what? <laughs> um, yes, it's very painful. I, you know, I think for the longest time, I viewed it just like that, right? Like I viewed like, I've done all this, I've poured all in this, and the gold medal is the only thing that matters. And I have this tunnel vision and forgot all the other accomplishments, the world records, uh, the skill sets I, you know, was able to pick up through all those years of hard work and suck and, you know, ups and downs. And, uh, you know, I think that's been the real win of understanding those things. And if I just looked at it in the way that you just, said that, I would still be, you know, in bed underneath the sheets and, and not wanting to keep going. But um, there's just so much more to it than that. And I think it's really allowed me to speak to and relate to so many people because so many people have that happen. And it's like, yeah. okay, then what? What's next? I don't think, you know, what, what I find really, like, I, I, what I really admire about you um, and other athletes I've met, but specifically, like, you're your drive, your focus, like from the age of, of <laughs> being young, you know, five, six, seven, getting into swimming. Um, you know, I swam, I swam in an aquatic club as well for a few years at that age. Uh, <laughs> I also like breaststroke. That was also a fun stroke for me, but I mean, I don't think, I don't think I've ever wanted anything as much as it seems like you were focused on your sport. Does that come from competitiveness? Does that come from were you like compensating for something <laughs> like, like where does that drive and desire come from? I know. And you know, what's funny. I think that's another thing that now looking back uh, on my career and understanding that that was not normal. I think in the moment it was like, you know, I'm just driving toward this. I have blinders on. Um, and I think that was really my secret weapon. It continues to be my secret weapon. This just ability to hyper-focus on something and just, squeeze out every last drop of possibility um, and just paying attention to the most minute details that I think a lot of people maybe wouldn't. Yeah. And I, I wish I could say like, I, I don't, I knew where it came from. I, you know, I think partly was, I was born that way. I was born very obsessive compulsive, like to how my dolls align at age of three and four. Um, but I also think the environment that I was in, you know, my parents always, just allowed me to run with it. And I think had they not seen their child have this hyper focus ability and had, you know, pushed me too hard, I think they could have pushed it out of me. And so I think it, it's the combination. And then, you know, the third thing, finding something that just lit me up, you know, finding yeah. find something really early on that I was like, wow, I really like doing this. I'm passionate about this. I understand how to be good at this from, you know, the age of nine. Um, so I am, I think, a partly... Yes, I had these things, but I got lucky that it, it clicked pretty quickly early on in life. Yeah, and so for anyone who doesn't, who isn't familiar with your story, um, I mean, you were you were like really like from a swimming point of view, you were swimming and breaking state records, and then you were just working so quickly through the sport at the age of like. 15 you're you're doing i don't even know all the terms like there's just there's just so many things that you were doing that were so amazing like you yeah. were very very young to yeah. be as as far along as you were even in the world of swimming i mean it's like it's remarkable where was that i mean it was obviously hard work because i heard about your schedule and your routine and it's coaching and it's nutrition and it's focus and it's drive and it's desire but it's it's got to be more than just that no for sure. I, you know, and I think, 
yeah, to, to make an Olympic team at, at 15, there was definitely some other things at play. And I think for me, it was just like the above and beyond stuff. Like everyone goes to practice every day, right? Like everyone shows up for the most part. Maybe there's a couple slackers out there, but, but there are a lot of people that are good that do that. And I think for me, you know, from literally we'd be a half a mile down the road and I realized that I forgot just 10 pull-ups, like just 10 pull-ups out of, you know, 50 that we were doing. And I made my mom turn the car around because I was like, I cannot leave this day without having it fully completed. Like I just would do, and that was a daily thing. But that was, was that perfectionism? Was that achievement? Was that like knowing, like, if I do this, I will get a better outcome? Like what was driving that? I think it was the thought of being behind the blocks before a big event and not being able to fully 150% confidently say I did every possible thing out there Mm. to be prepared for this race and to be confident. And my confidence was always derived from action. Like it was, I was never someone that people would always say, no, just, just, just believe in yourself. Just, you just got to throw it out there and be, you know, which there's a lot to positive affirmation, but for me, it was no, no, no. Like I need to look back on my body of work over the last year, over the last four years and no, like anyone challenged me. I knew that the each day was exhausted. Even if the, the times weren't there, I would, the effort was without a doubt, 150% in every bucket of my life. Hmm. That is so interesting because again, like I, I would think that anyone who had that level, you know, like you, you have that level of drive and desire and commitment Mm -hmm. and you know what it takes. And then you were able to see, um, you were able to get feedback. Like you just emotionally, you were able to get momentum and progress and win. Um, and so you, you were able to get on the Olympic team and you were able to to face. I mean, I'll we'll flash forward really far, right? You're able to get to the point where, you know, you are you are on the Olympic team. You're in Beijing, right? You have all of these shots to get that gold. But bef- before we get into that, why was what was it about the gold? Like, because because you, you you place a lot of importance all of those years in like being at the top of the podium, getting that gold, being that champion. Uh, I spoke to, um, you know, I, I spoke to Sonia um, uh, Wick, first podcast episode ever. She really wanted to, to win the, uh, the Kona, right? The Ironman Kona in her age group. And she came in second and I said, oh, that must have been devastating. And she was like, no, no, it was great because I still did the very best I could. And I was like, oh, Okay. Like you we'll didn't have differing opinions on that. <laughs> <laughs> like like yeah. I can just, you know, we only see not only do we only see as spectators a little sliver of time. Yeah. We see like I'm Canadian. So I get the chance to watch the Canadian um, Olympic journey and the American Olympic journey and my goodness, do they package your stories into this like road of like awesomeness and you're just like it's it's a spectacle to watch like americans celebrate americans and and that's all on your shoulders you're like a young woman you're like you've worked all of these days i mean it's just it almost seems too much to place on someone no yeah it's actually funny i to this day i mean that was what 13 years ago uh, i was i was watching the the italy the soccer game the italy england game which was crazy um on sunday and some people were like oh my gosh like that kid like that poor kid like he's only 19 like so much pressure and i was like yeah wait a second <laughs> like i was 19 and i was you know what i mean so at the time i i don't think again like i didn't have the perspective it was just kind of like okay, like, this is just what's happening. It's all happening so fast. You know, these comparisons are being made to Michael Phelps uh, and me. And it's just like, it just, it it was all this crazy snowball. And I think, you know, for, for anyone who dreams of going to the Olympics, I mean, and maybe this is a little bit of of American culture of like, it's gold or nothing, you know, that's, Mm -hmm. that's what's out there. That's what the media is talking about. That's what you dream of. And, you know, obviously I, 
I just didn't time it out the right way. Right. Like I got gold in 05 and I got gold in 07 at the world championships. And I just, I think for me, it was, it was less about, yes, there were expectations for me to win all these gold medals, but for me, that was kind of like on my bucket list of accomplishments to feel like I had the full trifecta of American record, world record, world championship, gold medal, Olympic gold medal. Like that is kind of the full uh, circle in my mind of, yeah. of accomplishing everything. And so to go and, you know, I did do my best, right? Like I, I have to look back and say, I had, you know, I broke an American record in the tuna freestyle and it ended up being fourth. Like I didn't even medal in that event. So I can now look back and go, you know, I, I gave all my effort and I should be fully satisfied with that or I should, but there, I think I say this in my book, like it's always going to sting. Like I'm never going to have someone say, you know, silver medalist and be like, <laughs> you know, I'm always going to have that. I've, and I've think- heard, I've heard you say that. And it's just like, so, so here's, here's the question I have. Do you think yeah. you can be as determined as you were, as young as you were, see the success that you saw, put the time in, put the dedication in? Could you have those things without having that like laser focus on the gold, 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 gold? Um, do you think those are pairs that just kind of come together? I don't think, I personally don't think so because the, the, the reason I was so laser focused was, And I believe this in all aspects of life, like your goal in your mind has to be so exciting. And and so to some extent, like, you know, when I'm 12 years old saying that looking up in the mountaintop of gold medal is way out there, but that's what kept driving me, right? If it was, if it wasn't something that was so large in my mind, that was like, oh my God, if I do that, oh my God, right? Like it just, it, it lit a fire inside of me. And so that's why I was willing to do all of those things. That's why I was willing to turn around in the middle of, you know, a highway and go do my pull up. That's why I was willing to stay late. That's why, you know, all the crazy things that I did, they didn't seem crazy to me because it was like, yeah, well, like, this is what I believe is a hundred percent necessary to get to that, those ultimate goals that I had for myself. Yeah. See, I'm, uh, part of part of the secret reason I do this podcast is I'm so inspired and interested to hear people's stories and what they've done, and and you know I just I I almost wish that I wanted something as bad as it seems like you want it. Um, I'm not naturally that competitive. Um, it's like if I think I can do it, great. If I don't think I can, I'm like, okay. You know, it's just like, um, did you? Because like, okay, I'm guessing, I don't know a lot about you, but you have this super successful podcast. Like that, that's an extraordinary goal. Like that's something that drives but, me. Right. But right before we started recording, I was like, oh, I'm a little nervous because I want to make the most of it. And, and, and the you truth think is I'm like. You freaking out before all my races? <laughs> <laughs> it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Well, and so, 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 you know, that, that idea of the one shot, right. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think what I was, oh, I was watching, I was watching the Netflix show cheer. I don't know. Have you, have you watched the, the yeah. yeah, have you seen that? Mm-hmm. I, I like was riveted. I loved it. But the thought of, um, you know, these, these, a- these athletes, not in the spotlight, um, in a career where there's no way to graduate, there's nothing to move into. You have your, like, you have your, whatever it is, one and a half minute routine once, through the year and that is your shot i was like what like like it seems crazy to me and then as i'm working through your stories i'm working through your book i'm like this is the same thing right like you're working 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 yeah if your age and if everything lines up the olympics come every four years um you know certainly there's there's like national events and world events and other things but I mean, to the outside, that doesn't seem as important i mean to to the athletes are is it as important as an olympic game no, I mean it's definitely it's definitely <laughs> you know the Pan your- the Pan Am games or like the 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 Commonwealth games and like all these other things like they're not the Olympics, right? They're not the pinnacle. <laughs> no, I mean in terms of like your professional career, um, like I would say World Championships is definitely seen, and and I think it's getting more notoriety. But no, it it certainly doesn't. Uh, Olympic medals and World Championship medals do not have the same type of weight and clout and and all of those things. Um, 
so yeah, it, it is every four years and it, it's, it's funny because I, I love him to get the question of, Oh my God, like, how do you, how do you reset? Like after, after I was, you know, in Oh four, it's like seen like four long years, but like, I think that's again, like the, going back to like the little wins and the, di- the daily details, like that's what kept me sane. Like that's what mm-hmm. kept me not looking ahead and being like, Oh my God, like four years of just oil. Like how, you know, that it wasn't like that. It was like, all right, so today here's my goal in practice down to the hundredth of a second. Here's what I'm doing. If I can check the box on this day, amazing next day, you know, like it, it just kind of was worked that way for me. And that's how I was able to stay, stay so motivated for so long because I kept feeling like each win led to another win led to another. And the momentum just kept moving me forward, regardless of, you know, if I had tough days or, or days where I was, you know, maybe struggling with the motivation, it was close enough that it kept pushing me along. Um, but I, I I just going back to your point about this, this pinnacle and this, you know, one shot, like that's also kind of why you do it. Like you're an adrenaline junkie. Like, is is that what it is? Like, you're just like addicted to the, 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 the chance, the shot that you have. I think I'm and even to this day, like my husband will will get mad at me because, you know, I'm, I'm not like, I'm not hot too high, not too low type of person. I wish I was like, just steady as she, like, no, like I'm here. I'm boom and boom and boom. Like, you know, I crave the, the high and, you know, I don't know in this book, I I should do a word search. I don't know how many times you mentioned crying, but (laughs) I was like, I was like, wow, like, awesome. Like, (laughs) I'm glad that you lay it all out there. Uh, No, I just, and and I, someone had said that to me before, like, well, well, if you just don't get your hopes up too high or don't, you know, then you won't have this crazy down. Right. Because of course there's times where I'm shot really high and have my expectations just all super hyper focus. And then, right. It, then it doesn't happen. And then you just have this super long fall down because you're so high, but I've always been like, but, but then the high, like when it does happen, I'd rather have, you know, three insane highs in my life and maybe, you know, quadruple as many lows. <laughs> then just live in the middle. Like, I just believe like the highs are so high. And I think a lot of times I have this theory that the people that maybe say like, Oh, like I just couldn't do that. They just haven't gotten that hit that high yet from doing something crazy. And I think I just experienced that kind of hit of that extraordinary feeling that I was like, Oh my God, like I just became a junkie. Like I was like, I need more of that. Give me more of that. And I just keep to this day, right. I'm just constantly chasing that feeling and it there's good and bad, right. You you have a lot more ups and downs, but I, I can't help it. It's just, do you, do you think this is interesting? I just thought of this while you were speaking, you know, so many people are afraid to set really big goals because what if I don't hit them or what if, uh, I don't hit them. Like, what if I don't hit them? And I told people, and now I look like a liar, or I look like a loser, or I look like I couldn't do it. So most people don't even set big goals. If they do set big goals kind of in their hearts, they certainly don't say them out loud. They don't really believe they can be hit. Um, and they just kind of want to live. They don't want to, but they just live life in mediocrity. You know, the word mediocrity, the opposite of extraordinary. Um, and it's just like, oh, it's so painful to watch there are some of us who want those big highs that you've had, but we're still too afraid to risk those lows, right? You know, we don't, we don't play to win. We play not to lose. Mm-hmm. And if there's one thing I'd really admire in your story is um, you played to win. Like, like even the way that you describe your races and the energy it takes and the difference between 50 meters and, and, you know, and it's two and a half minutes of hell or it's eight minutes of this. And it's just like, holy smokes. Like you, you go for it. You really go for it. But for those who are too afraid to go for it or, or they, you know, they want the high, but they don't want to risk the low. What do you say to those people? I think part of that fear also comes from thinking about it long-term Like if you can think of, I think if someone was like given the choice of like, well, it's just going to be once, but then after that, you, I mean, you can't just do it one time in your life, right? You got to keep, you got to keep going, There's you know, 50 years left, but it gets, I I would say 
go for it because after the one time, like the one fail that will inevitably happen, like it's just going to happen if you put it out there enough times, it gets way easier because you prove to yourself that you get back up, right? Like you have the people around you. And I think after my big moment like that was putting it on the line for Athens, making the Olympic team at 15, which was like this ultimate high going, feeling like I going up all over the pool deck, <laughs> <laughs> feeling like I failed in front of millions of people at home. And that was my, wow. I just literally failed in front of millions of people. And I felt like I, I've just ripped off this bandaid and I proved to myself, no, 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 I'm, I'm getting back up. I can be relentless. And I felt like after that, it didn't, you know, obviously failing doesn't ever feel good, but there wasn't ever a moment where I was like, well, like I always kept getting back up. Like it was almost like I just had learned how to do it after the first time. And so I was able to, I'm never going to say it was easier, but it, I was capable. And I think that takes away some of the fear because you know you're capable. Right. Um, and so that's what I would say to people, like just rip off the Band-Aid, rip off the Band-Aid, see how you react. And I guess if you can't get back up, then you learned your lesson, but no one's ever, no one is going, I've never seen someone put it all out there and not be able to get up in some way because they have the courage to put it all out there. Like if you have the courage to put it all out there, you have the courage to get back up. Like the two are linked. So that is what I would say. Oh. That's so good. That's so good. When you're, when, you know, we're watching on camera, you know, the people on the pool deck and they're swinging their arms around, they got their headphones on they're getting yeah. psyched up or whatnot, but you know, you're there and there's the, the, the loudness and, you know, the cold tiles and the smell of chlorine and, and, and you have, you know, you have your competitors to the right and to the left of you and lane selection matters and all this stuff, like all this stuff that's happening. How do you, not allow, you know, like you meant, you mentioned even like, Oh, that was a really fast race they were running. And it's like, cause you're so on the times, like you have, I've heard you talk about your whiteboards and your charts and you're just like so focused on the details, but how do you not allow the competitors, the other swimmers, the other people, all of that stuff, how do you not allow that to both distract you, but also, um, I mean, it's a very objective sport. Like People mm -hmm. are better than you that day. Maybe not all the time, but they're better than you that day or they're not better than you. How do you not let that get in your head? That's a great question. I think in terms of the, like the swimmers being like physically around you, um, like the crowd, all of the external things, that, that piece didn't really bother me. I think, I mean, I was the one who had my goggles on before we even walked out. Like I wanted my like Uggs and my jacket off before. Cause I just was like beeline for the lane. Like I have blinders. I'm not smart. I don't, I didn't want to smile to the crowd. Like I wasn't paying attention to it. This one is jumping next to me. Like those, those, I think, cause I was just so, I couldn't even tell you what music was playing. At, like I didn't listen to music. The hard part for me was being so dialed into the details, I could tell you exactly what so-and-so was on her third 50 at a meet three months ago. Like I was just so dialed into that, which was, was a plus because I, I definitely knew how people swam their races, uh, you know, typically, but when things went awry, like in the 400 free in Beijing, normally those two girls took it out super fast. Yeah. Really on the first 200, you know, they, the race played out differently. And so I so think in, in this, in this race, this was just for the audience. This was, um, one of like five, I think races that you were, that you were a part of that you could have metal contention with. And, yeah. and so, and the way you describe it, or I guess the way it happened is these races are like happening, like over the course of a few days, but there's all this other stuff happening as well. And so, <laughs> And so you were saying that you would normally, uh, you would normally, you know, not be as out front as you were, but halfway through the race or something, you're like way out front because everyone else went super slow and it kind of confused you. Right. Yeah. It was interesting because the strategy in the prelims, you know, the, the girls that were ranked ahead of me, I went in ranked third to the finals took it way out. And so my plan was typically if you watch the race, even in the trials, I flipped fourth at the 200 and then I got half it and I didn't take the race out 
like an idiot or anything. I swam it the same way. It's just that everyone was way back. And so I remember consciously making a decision like, well, I don't want to use this, you know, energy to like pull myself back. You know, I'm, I, I should, I need to just go. We're at the 200 at this point, but there was that internal thing going on that honestly shouldn't have been happening. It should have just been like, okay, put your blinders on, focus on your, on your race. And it just happened to be a very weird type of play out in a race, which happens sometimes when you put, you know, the top eight in the world together, things shuffle, like it's, it's not that abnormal. Uh, but I think that was always my struggle in any of my longer races, which is the races that would stress me out because there's so much strategy around it. Um, whether it was my 400 IM where it took me what four years to be able to figure out internationally how to race that race. And so that was, I think, really where I struggled and had to put blinders on um, when I when I won the race or or when I did it. it it's, I think a lot of people struggle with stay in your lane, like that yeah. comes from swimming, like stay in your lane in any aspect of life. Yeah. Now you you did mention that race. So there was the race where you know your first your first event you didn't you didn't win you won bronze. The second event, you came to within seven one hundredths of a second to winning gold. So you won a silver. Mm -hmm. And and then the next race was, uh, I think, an 800. Um, and it didn't go well. And, and ultimately, you were able to come out of the games winning two bronze medals and a silver medal. Um, and you were saying, you know, everyone was telling you, oh, you won these medals and this is great. Yeah. Um, but deep down inside, you were disappointed. I don't think there's anything wrong with that disappointment. What I'm actually most curious about is why you felt you couldn't explain that you were disappointed with two bronzes and a silver what, when you really wanted that gold. Like, like it's interesting to me that it was only in your TED talk, I think you said in 2018, that you actually admitted that you were disappointed by not winning a gold, but by winning two bronzes and a silver. So that's a long time to feel like you can't say that out loud. Yeah, that's because no one's ever asked me that. Uh, I think the struggle was that, and it, to this day, I've had conversations with you know friends or old teammates. If you go in and say you're ranked seventh or eighth in the foreign giant, and you drop like two seconds off your best time, and you weren't even, you were maybe on the outside shot of winning a medal, but you win silver, like that is seen as a victory, right? Like that's seen as an amazing thing. And there are tons of athletes who come away with three medals and that's celebrated and it, it's fantastic. Right. And so I think because I went in with these expectations of coming away with, you know, kind of realistically, potentially three or four gold medals, that was the opposite for me. And it wasn't just me saying that it was, you know, other, other people saying that the media saying that. And so to yes, the media saying it, but it was almost like I was straddling this weird thing of like, I didn't want to admit into the negative things that the media were saying. Like I almost didn't want to agree with them. But on the other side, I didn't want to sound to others like, wow, I'm super ungrateful for winning these medals. And so I didn't really understand how to even explain how I felt in a way that I felt like would make sense and not offend people all at the same time when ultimately I probably shouldn't have cared. I probably should have just said, this is how I feel. And, and that that's the case. And, and here's why. Um, but it, I think, I think it happens a lot more in life and I'm very aware of it now of, you know, when someone accomplishes something that to someone else might be this mega accomplishment, like Say someone gets promoted, but in their they promoted to VP, but they're coming over from another another company where they were CEO. To someone else, being a you know VP at a company is like the most amazing accomplishment in their life. But to the CEO at the former company, they're like, well, that's a demotion. Yeah. And so I think that happens. I, I'm so hyper aware of it now to not do that to others. Like, well, she's at least she's got that. You know, like I think we're we're just as humans, we do that. And yeah. so I felt like that happened a lot to me. Well, like, at least you went to the Olympics. Well, at least you meddled. Like, those were things that were being said. And so I felt like, oh, okay, well, maybe I can't say that without sounding ungrateful or sounding like I wasn't, you know, happy to be there and happy to have experienced it. But when I'm thinking here and I end here, for me and my barometer, it was a fail. 
do you think do you think that's do you think that's different for male versus female athletes? Like, do you think a male athlete could walk away from that and just say, disappointed, not happy this, you know, and, and it's, and it's actually different or does it have nothing to do with gender? It just has to do with, with the fact that you didn't want to make people feel bad. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like the, I don't know. I, I don't know if it's more personality, but I obviously I think females are, are definitely prone to be more people pleasers for sure. And so I think, yeah, part of it was, me caring a lot about what people thought and what I was saying. Um, and again, I think part of me was the kind of rebelling. It's like, well, I don't want uh, these, the, these people are hounding. I'm getting out of the water. And, and the media was like, well, you must be upset. You must be disappointed. You know, trying to I'm like, well, don't tell me how I'm supposed to feel, you know, like I just want a best time. Like, don't tell yeah. me I'm supposed to feel. And then on the other end of my mind being like, well, yeah, I am disappointed. You know, I am not happy. And so it was just like swirl of emotions where I would, you know, one day I'd be okay. And then someone could say some of the smallest thing someone would say would trigger me. And I would be upset whether it was in an interview or a teammate, or I would see someone do something with their gold medal and think, you know, so it was just this constant struggle. And it, yeah, like it took so long for me to be able to be like, maybe I should just say it and see what happens, <laughs> see how it's taken. Um, and that's okay. Like I didn't want to come off as negative or any, you know, and then I finally did. And the reaction was so positive at, at the Ted talk that it was just this freeing moment of, wow, like people can, you know, actually understand this experience and relate to it. And maybe this could be a positive, a, a negative, like a positive thing talking about this experience more. Yeah. Um, just had to bang my head against the wall like 50 times before I figured out it was okay to emote. Well, that's, and that's why I found it, I found it curious because I, I can, un, I can understand your point of view and maybe this is the time we're living in, you know, and people are feeling much more free than they were 15 years ago or whatever yeah. it may have been. But, um, and, and certainly the, with, with perspective, as you're looking back, you're not so much in the media bubble or any of those types of things. But um, I just found it curious, not that you were disappointed by not winning a gold, but, but that, yeah, that you felt you couldn't even say that. I was like, oh, that seems like a double burden to not only have that. Uh, now, I mean, at the time it was like, well, I get another shot at this, right? There's another Olympics. There's another opportunity. There's another chance I can keep training. You didn't know at the time that that would be the closest, I guess, you would come to that because of health issues and because of other challenges. Yeah. Um, thank goodness. Cause that would have been yet another <laughs> layer. I'm glad I didn't know, um, at the time. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, even, even when people would want to seem like I had family members or people that would be over to our apartment, you know, years later, like, Oh my God, are they here? Like, are the medals here? And I was like, I, you know, like I just kind of throw them at them. Cause I'm like, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't even want to look at them. They'd be like, was it so amazing? You know, like that. So I think it was more the time had passed where like that media bubble of kind of explosion of the negativity happened. And then a few years went by and then no one who had entered my life then really, really had been in that moment and seen that. And so they're like, Oh my God, like, can I see them? Can I put them on? Can I take pictures with them? And I was just, I, you know, would I, my husband knew obviously, and he would just kind of watch me as I would just be like, yeah, here you go. Like I have to explain them. And yeah, yeah. It, it just, it wasn't, and, but in that moment, what am I supposed to be like? Yeah. I hate them, but like here, you know, <laughs> it would, it's, it's not a natural thing to do. It's more interesting though. It really makes for a better dinner party. I think if you could be like, <laughs> here they are, take them out. <laughs> I don't want to look at them anymore. You know, they um, go. but yeah, I mean, who, who said, uh, Rich Roll, when I was on his podcast, he was like, now that is an opening for a TED Talk. Hi, my name is Katie Hoff. I'm an Olympian and I hate my Olympic medals. He was like, start yes. with that. <laughs> but obviously now they're, you know, they're behind me and, and I display them and I'm a better place. But yeah, probably about five or six years worth of just here. Yeah. There. You know, um, years ago, and this, this gentleman has passed since uh, I had the chance to meet him, but there was I'm Canadian. I'm up here in Canada. There was, um, I was doing a project in a long-term care facility. So I spent a full week in, in like a long-term care. So like a retirement home for people who need extra care. And there was a man there named Christopher Chapman who had Alzheimer's <clears throat> and he was in his eighties. He was, he was there and I was speaking with his wife and I spent a week with them. Um, 
And she said, Oh, has he pulled out his Oscar? And I was like, he has an Oscar. And she's like, yeah, yeah. He like, uh, he likes to pull it out and he likes to do photos and he likes to bring it around. They do movie nights. And so there's a photo of me like standing with this amazing guy, like holding his Oscar. And I'm like, wow, it's heavy and it's cool. And I'm looking at this. It's like from 1967. He directed a short film. It, um, it's famous up here because it created our provincial song that people like to say. And I was like holding this Oscar and it's amazing. And I'm like, Oh, that's so cool. And people are like, oh, that's an Oscar. And so, so like people will be like, Olympic medals. Cool. Like, I mean, I could see, I could see the draw, but then I also thought, you know, this man was in his eighties at this point. Um, he had, you know, he'd gotten the Oscar in the six, in the sixties. So like after 10 years, 20 years, 30, 40 years of it, it kind of has to become at a certain point, either like something you just kind of embrace, like people, I think who are like people who are famous for being on a sitcom in the eighties who are no longer famous where they just, they just embrace it. And that's what it is. Or they, they learn to like hate it. I think mm -hmm. as, as being stuck that way, as you progressed from being a professional athlete, being in the Olympics, being in that world to where you are today, I know there was a lot of bumps and adjustments along the way, but, but how, how do you not feel like, you peaked too soon, like you, cause you saw so, you, so much focus, so much dedication, so much success early on. Life is so long now. I mean, I always feel like I feel really behind when I was 25. I felt like I was way ahead of everyone. And then in my thirties, I was like, I'm just, I'm just, people are catching up. I'm just falling behind. Like, like what's going on? Like, how do you not, how do you not look at that time that way? And how do you bridge that gap? Yeah, it's really tough. I think my mantra lately, or even the last couple of years is like, I just want everything to make sense. Like, mm. I'll give you an example, like my pulmonary embolism. So people listening probably don't realize that's what ended my career. I had a pulmonary embolism, blood clots in my right lung. And for the longest time, I was so bitter at that. It's like, well, why did that happen? It doesn't make sense. Like, obviously things in life don't always make sense, but I just wanted it to just to feel resolution and feel like, okay, now I can turn things that happened in my career into making sense now in my current life. And now I'm working with the National Blood Clot Alliance um, and I'm their first ambassador. And so I'm able to use that experience and you know, give speeches and you know, raise awareness and talk to doctors. And so that's one example where it's like, okay, like I've bridged the gap. It's, it's you know, something that I'm passionate about. It's something I feel like I'm actually making an impact, which is very closely related to feeling extraordinary for me, which is a huge driver in my swimming career. And now, um, and then, you know, like, I think all the skills like that we talked about, about me being like a crazy person of just being hyper-focused, I am able to call upon those things now in the same way. Like mm. now the, the hard part is <laughs> the rest of life is not like athletics, right? It's not like put in this effort. I know what my competitors are doing and, you know, execute and you probably are going to get a result that you're, you're pretty sure you can accomplish, right? There's other, a lot of other factors in life, in sales, in, you know, all those things. And so that's the challenge of managing that emotion, managing those expectations. But I've, I've heard you, sorry, I've heard you say this a few times. And so it's interesting to me that you see athletics that way, where it's like very structured in terms of what you have to do, maybe what you have to eat, the training you have to do, um, the numbers you have to hit, like, uh, it's very, it's very interesting to me, actually, just the resources you might have, the coaching you might have, the mindset you might have. Is it really, is it really that structured that you're able to see these amazing gains very quickly? And then if so, how can we not build, why, like, why aren't we building this structure into other areas of our life? I mean, if that's really what it comes down to. I mean, I think it's not like you're gaining, 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 right? Like I think in terms of though, understanding, okay, here's what I'm like. There wasn't ever a meet that I went into where I wasn't like, I'm either going to crush it or I don't think it's going to happen. Like regardless of what my mentality or how positive I was being, you know, like, you know, because you're, you're not blindly. So, I mean, I don't know how people do it, but like, if they do, but like, you're not blindly swimming workouts, you have your times, you have your paces. Like I was someone who paid attention to that for the sole reason of knowing if I'm progressing. Right. So if training's not progressing and the times aren't there, then it's like, okay, like let's shift, let's pivot, let's try something new. And that definitely happened later on in my career. 
for sure, where things weren't working and I was kind of searching and I don't know, I think I finally found at the end of my career again before the blood clots happened, but it is, it's just, you have instant feedback of today was a good practice because X, Y, Z. And mine was sometimes it's maybe the technique was good and I felt the flow for the water, but let's be real. Like if I hit my paces for the day, I felt super victorious and I ended the day and I wish that was how we could structure life outside of it, right? Like maybe you have a really good call with someone and you felt like you've made a good connection, but it's not like they're like, okay, you, you hang up the phone. Because of that call, you will set, you know, three podcast visits and you will be nominated for this award. Like it's just, it doesn't translate in the same way. Um, and I think that's why I found life after swimming extremely frustrating. Because have you it, tried? I have. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, you, I you have. tried. <laughs> but you're saying tried to to, to to structure to structure everything in these in these nice boxes. Yeah, it, it's it doesn't work. It's really <laughs> <laughs> Mark. I have tried, and I it doesn't tried. work. I track everything from yeah, it just doesn't have that same. But I I think the thing to get back to your question of how do you transcend and not feel like, like that's just going to be the highlight of my life is, you know, I think being able to, instead of it's this performance that makes me feel extraordinary. It's like the, the, the speaking making like the speaking to me is like a performance, right? You go out, you speak to everyone and the feedback is not a time. The feedback is the crowd applauding and getting really good feedback from people in the crowd or someone saying, Hey, like I've been going through it. And like, that spoke to me, like those are my medals now. And while it might sound like, okay, well, it's not an Olympic medal. It helps things make sense. Like everything is leading towards this because had I not won Olympic medals, had I not failed and won a silver, had I not gone through all these things, had I not got a blood clot, I wouldn't have been able to speak about, you know, speak to people about, you know, finding an extra gear and, and overcoming things and being relentless. I wouldn't be able to speak about what it feels like to get a blood clot and the recovery, like all those things kind of feel like it's just part of a culmination and not like a boom. And now what that felt like that for a while, but not a boom and just drop off and nothing else happens the rest of my life, yeah. you know? So yeah, it just, things make sense. And that's where I need to be to feel extraordinary and happy. Yeah, that's so cool. And I love that you keep using that word. So I have a friend, Evan Carmichael, who wrote a book here, One Word. And he believes that that there's a single word that really captures your, your, your true core values. Um, and years before he wrote this book, I was, so I started my company in 2006, a marketing agency. And, um, I've known him for a very long time, but, but years earlier, we were on a call one afternoon and I was just feeling so down. I was feeling so down. And I just kind of had the courage to say, listen, man, like, I just want to be extraordinary, like extra ordinary. I want to be an extraordinary father, husband, business owner. It's just like, everything just feels so average. And, and even in your book, when you talk about mediocrity, like to me, mediocrity is the, is the opposite of being extraordinary. Yeah. And so I, I confessed this to him. And then a few years later, maybe two years later, he calls me up. He says, the, that, that time that you talked to me about being extraordinary, are you doing it? Like, are you doing it? Do you, do you have an extraordinary company? Do you have extraordinary clients? Do you only do extraordinary work? Do you pick and choose only to do the things that are extraordinary? You know, your life, your house, all of that stuff. And the reason he was asking me is because he was working on this book. And so like he worked through it and maybe this was in 2015 or 16. And so um, to me, like every time that someone says that word, every time that word pops off, it's just like, oh man, do I understand kind of what you're feeling in that drive. But the most interesting thing to me now, all these years later, having worked through the book and worked through all of these things and, and wanting to be extraordinary um, is you know, our greatest strengths are our greatest weaknesses. And the same thing is true with this. Like, like you strive to be extraordinary. You want to be extraordinary. And at the same time, the thing that you feel like you're not enough of is being extraordinary. Like, like his one word is believe. He wants everyone to believe. And the thing that he feels that he's not doing 
is, is enough belief, right? Like, it's just like this, this like drive and desire. And at the same time, you just this weight that you have to carry all the time. Yeah. It's, it's funny. I, it's, I, it's actually something I love getting in debates or discussions about, because I think many people have different thoughts on this, right. Of, of whether everyone actually wants to be extraordinary. Are some people just okay? I mean, we kind of touched on this earlier in our conversation, um, but that is something I was talking to my mom about. She's like, just remember on times when maybe I'm not, you're not feeling like you're being extraordinary enough. She said exactly what you just said. Like your extraordinary is constantly striving and constantly shaping that. Like not everyone is, is wired like that. And that's why some people I think struggle more than others to understand the value. And like I said, the high of that. But because of that, I'm constantly feeling I'm not, I've never really, or I have to force myself to try to live in the moment because it's constantly like, okay, cool. I accomplished that. But like, all right, in order to maintain my level of extraordinary, I need to do the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And I never have that. Okay. You know, like I, I constantly, and my husband's the same way. So we do not (laughs) go further out with that. Like we're just both like next, 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 next. And it's awesome. And that's why we've been able to accomplish a lot of things, but we, we could do for a dose of just, Hey, you just accomplished something. Chill for a second, look around and be like, great. Yeah. Look what I did. It doesn't mean you're being complacent. It doesn't mean you're being mediocre. Obviously if you just chilled for like multiple years and like rested on your laurels, but I think that's my biggest weakness is not taking a second, taking a breath and living in the moment. And I'm actually envious of people who do who have mastered that skill or do have that naturally. Um, so much. My wife and I talk about this so much. Yeah. So I just, I just finished a um, 120 day health challenge where oh, wow. um, I used to be, you know, fairly heavy. Uh, and so slowly kind of over three years, I was losing weight and I'm getting more physically active and going to the gym and working out. But um, I decided that I wanted at the age of 38 for the first time ever to be like lean, like six pack abs kind of lean. So I, I did 120 days of like personal training, like working, like doing two a days, five times a week, strict meal plan, all that stuff. No cheating, not a, like nothing off um, book. And so when I finished, like I, I did a great weigh in great photos. I had totally lost 70 pounds from kind of three years ago to like, to like where I was. And this is only a week and a half ago. Oh my um, God. Good for you. Good. <laughs> well, thank you. But here's, here's the thing. When you're talking about the structure, like as soon as the challenge was over, I was like, I like, I I've been on keto or in this health challenge for two years. So it's like, I haven't had like beer in two years. I haven't had like pasta in two years. I haven't had sushi. So it's like when this, this challenge was so hard and there were some days where I was like on 1100 calories through cuts and all these things. And I was like, I was like, when this is over, I'm just going to eat all those foods I wanted. Yeah. And so, uh, I, yeah. So like for a week I took off of exercising, I took off of the diet. I gained probably 10 pounds back pretty easily. Oh, probably felt so awful too. After oh that. my goodness. So the first day, <laughs> so I think I calculated there was one day I tracked my calories and I hit 7,000 calories and I stopped tracking. Um, but, oh, wow. but there was, <laughs> there was the first night I woke up at one thirty and felt so bad that I tried, I shouldn't say this. I tried to make myself throw up because I was having trouble breathing. Um, my heart rate monitor was like, I usually sleep at like in the low forties, high thirties, my heart rate, it's usually yeah. average around 39 or 40. It was in 95. <laughs> and oh so I was like, I was like, I think I need to go get my stomach pumped. Like I felt so bad. Now I got through the night. Um, but, but here, here was where I was going with this story. It's like, um, a few days in to this binge, I almost forgot that I was capable of doing those really good things. Mm-hmm. Like, like I, I so quickly slipped back into the old version of me. I felt so bad about myself. I was eating and not enjoying it. I, you know, even now, like I'm, I'm heavier than I was two weeks ago when I was leaner. Um, and so I got back into my routine. I got back into the meal plan. I got back into things, but in, in that week and a half, it felt so it felt so dangerous. Like I had, I had, I couldn't do it. I lost it. I don't know what I'm doing. I felt so lost so quickly. Mm-hmm. And now that I'm getting back into things, it's like, Oh no, I'm teaching myself. Of course I can work out. I mean, I just did this. Of course I can eat well. I just like all of these things. The question I have for you is as you move out of pro- being a professional athlete, 
as you move into what's next, as you look even forward, how do you remind yourself of how badass you really are and how badass you really were? And are you able to transfer all of those skills forward? Or is it more like me where it's like suddenly you're four days out and you're like falling apart because you're like, I can't do any of this stuff. And everyone around me is like, Mark, it's okay, dude, you'll be fine. Just relax. Like, how do you not forget how awesome you really were or are, I should say? Uh yeah, it's funny because there have been moments, uh, even physically, you know, I'm, I'm, I haven't have like this crazy where I wanted to try Athlons or, you know, I want to run a hundred miles. Like I just don't have that urge. Um, and so I work out just for aesthetics. Like I want to look fit. I want to look good in a suit. Like that's really, and, and people actually have a hard time believing me on that. They're like, wait, what do you mean? You just want to like have good abs and like have a nice spot. Like, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, that's my goal. I'm sorry. Like, I don't, there, there just isn't anything like after you break world records, like it's hard to get excited to just finish a triathlon. I just, how there's nothing wrong with people who do go into that. I just, ha I don't get that same thrill. And so, you know, I'll be working out on the Peloton, uh, and it's really hard. And, and I just would be like, I kind of want to stop. And like, there's nothing really stopping me from stopping. But then in my mind, I'm like, wow, like, really? Like you're, you're thinking of stopping, like after, you know, you do five, five hours of training a day. And so I was starting to doubt, like, wow, did you lose your mentality? And what I realized it was that I wasn't, if I'm not in an environment where it, the stakes are high, you know, it's like super challenging. Like I'm proud to say I finished, like there's not, no one's being like, oh, wow, congrats. You finished your Peloton class, right? Like there's nothing so what renewed my faith is anytime we've done anything, like I went and, and spoke at Jesse Itzler's um, Build Your Life resume camp, and I was asked to do this three-hour challenge. Now, I didn't know what the challenge was. I was just like, well, obviously, I'm going to participate in the challenge. Like, I'm speaking about being relentless, and like, I'm going to do it. And it was, oh, my gosh, one of the hardest things. It was like 10 miles of running, 10 stations of burpees. And in that moment, like at the halfway mark, uh, there wasn't a shred of doubt. It was like, yeah, I'm do I'm yeah, I'm doing this. I'm finishing this. I'm crushing this because like there's this is something that matters to me. And in that moment, I was like, oh, all right, I got it. Like I just have to be put in an environment where the pressure yeah. is high. It matters. Like I I feel extraordinary doing it, right? That yeah. comes again. And same thing for anything else mentally or um, you know, like with the speech, like something where there's a lot of people watching, the pressure is high. Like I will perform. Like I know I will because I have that skill set from my past. But the times when I'm just like, well, pff, why should I physically or mentally push past this? There's it doesn't feel like there's enough of a reason because I'm so used to performing when there's high stakes and it's do or die type situations. And so that's what's what I realized about myself. Um, and so do you I think it's healthier to try and turn up the dial and raise the stakes artificially. So that way you constantly perform, or do you think it's actually healthier to have these, you know, slower periods in your life? Um, that's a good question. I mean, I, it can't be, it can't be healthy to be just stressed out all the time with extreme pressure, but I think the key there is not to just like plan these random bumps. Like it's, it's do something that's leading up to it. So for example, if I'm working hard on a, on a new speech and I'm practicing every day, like those are, are things I'm not going to stop for because I'm training for something that is that ultimate. The reason the Peloton doesn't work is that I'm not training for the tour de France, right? Like I'm just <laughs> doing my 40 minute, five minute class and I get through them and I do it because I want to finish something, but I don't have that same level of maybe pushing it to crazy wattage because I'm not training for something. For me, that's just a, a kind of a goal of like, just look fit. Right. Yeah. So for me, it's, it's finding those things that, okay, like those little wins again, just like in swimming, those little daily wins, are pushing me towards a goal that means enough. And then I know for a fact, I will get into that mentality and follow things strictly and follow things to a T. Hmm. That's, that's really, you know, one thing that I try to tell myself, and if I'm not, if I haven't said this to myself in a while, I, I try to fix it. It's who does this? 
like not in like a negative way, like you're crazy, but like, if I can catch myself saying, who does this? Then I'm like, ah, okay. (laughs) Now we're doing something (laughs) interesting. Right. You know, I love that. Yeah. Like who does this? It's the same thing. You're saying the same thing, right? (laughs) If you're, if you're saying that you're not being mediocre because if you're mediocre, everyone's doing it. Right. Yeah. Something that's a little bit like, and it's putting you in this spot that most people won't go. That's true. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Uh, last question for you. Uh, I, this has been so much fun. Um, so typically I like to end with this for you at the end of the day, everything that you've been through, everything that you've learned, all of the experiences you have, everything that's in front of you. But at the end of the day, what does it all come down to? It comes down to feeling like all of my buckets are filled up, meaning I have a really good relationship with my my husband. We're in a really great spot. We're communicating well. We love each other. In business, I feel like everything's going well there. I'm progressing. I'm continuing to learn. I'm never at you know just this stopping point. It's, it's I always feel like I have I need to get better, meaning I can get more skills within that. Um, and then you know just general my my health and my family's health. Everyone's good and everyone's happy and healthy. Um, and I would say those are probably my three biggest buckets. And if I feel like all of those are happening, um, then. I can lay my head to rest and feel happy. That's so interesting because it's it's not any of the things that an achiever would be achieving for. It's all of the it's all of those things that most people say matter most, right? Like you just listed relationships. Yeah, relate well relationship. I mean, with the business piece, like it's you know accomplishing, hitting hitting certain numbers, um, you know, doing a certain number of speeches. Ah, okay. There's the whiteboard. We got the whiteboard. The whiteboard. Back, yeah. Don't worry. Get off camera. With math, there. <laughs> <laughs> Don't you think I could end? I could never just be like. I mean, those things are amazing, but I am driven by checking boxes, and <laughs> so it's still in there. You just didn't dig hard enough. <laughs> It was so good to be able to dig into the hard times Katie faced and the lessons that she learned. And also, listen, success from the outside doesn't mean that it feels like success on the inside. I think Katie made that clear. Okay, three key takeaways from this conversation. Number one, extraordinary things happen through extreme focus and dedication. If you want extraordinary opportunities, If you want to be an extraordinary person who does extraordinary things, you have to be fully committed. You have to put in the time. You have to put in the effort. You have to set your eyes at the very top. And even then, it doesn't always go your way. Which brings us to point number two. Sometimes you're not going to hit your goal. But instead of focusing on the results, focus on what got you there. The effort, how much you've grown, what you've accomplished. You may not take the sting out of the loss or the failure, as Katie called it, but you will be able to look back on it with fresh eyes one day. Come to peace with it. Number three, your past successes, they do not define you. Just because you've done something amazing in the past doesn't mean you can't go off and do another extraordinary thing in the future. You just need to find that next thing that lights you up. Now, if you have something to prove to the doubters, to the haters, that little voice that screams at you from the back of your mind, if that's you, then you have to face the difficult. You have to face the scary. You have to face the hard things in your life. It's not easy. It's never easy. But remember, we, we're not just dreamers. We're doers because we do hard things. If you need a shot of inspiration, you have got to hear the story of how this woman faced cancer and a divorce, and then went on to chase down her dream to be on television, which she did. Click on the video right over there to hear this real inspiring conversation.